Webinar, so good afternoon. Um, today, Victor will present uh, as a brown bag seminar, or we will change the name soon into Tupperware seminars or something like that. Um, so welcome and thanks for uh, being here. Victor has a Bachelor of Law and a Master's Degree in Marketing and Communications with uh, postgraduate studies, studies in local economic development. Um, I think it was part of uh, how do we diversify certain profiles in the in, in CIMED and in the program. And uh, in that sense, you were looking for experience in public-private partnerships, agriculture, marketing, agribusiness, and sustainable development. CIMED has, um, Victor, sorry, has lived in Asia, Europe, and America, where he worked for the FAO, dealing with farming market linkages, as well as agricultural market services. In Mexico, Victor was with the Inter-American Inter Development Bank uh, prior, prior to uh, joining CIMED. Here in CIMED, he has worked on public-private partnerships within the SIP program. He's component leader for Masagro Productor and has been working in different projects in the, uh, let, in the sustainable intensification strategy uh, on farmer market uh, linkages. And we'll present first today farmer market linkages in the context of sustainable intensification systems. And uh, before we start, thanks for uh, Victor for doing the effort, taking the time, like everybody else who's presenting the brown bags, to put your work out there to be looked at. Thanks. Hi, is this working? Yes. So thank you, Bram, for your presentation. Thanks, everyone, for taking the time to be here. Uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of what we have been doing in terms of farmer market linkages and how does this fit into existing uh, efforts and program uh, on uh, sustainable intensification strategy. So um, the presentation is going to start framing a little bit the scope of, of the activities we are doing, and then we will see some examples in actual projects. So uh, we like to define ourselves as providing input uh, in, this, in this sense, uh, by providing strategic interventions through the value networks of maize, wheat, and associated crops. Uh, it's perhaps interesting to highlight here associated crops because um, it's part of CIMIT's mission to work with, uh, with crops uh, different from maize and wheat, uh, but especially it's important in terms of, of markets, aiming at strengthening commercial relationships based on sustainability, innovation, and competitiveness. So what we have been doing was reviewing in which sense we could provide uh, some added value to what already was going on on the market and how we could kind of round the uh, activities that CIMIT was already doing and what we were already doing in projects dealing with sustainable intensification, being Masagro, the federal project, one of the main efforts. Here you can see or one of the infographies, one of the graphics that we are doing in which we kind of map the value chain. Uh, it's interesting to mention also that uh, we refer here value networks uh, we want to uh, refer that there are several um, readings on uh, value chain and value networks. What is the difference? So we don't think they are, uh, those are in comparable terms. We think those need to be combined. So in, for instance, in the finance, uh, the use of value networks have been used, have been used for years where they, when they refer to the single actors uh, in a given activity, uh, considering the different role they may have. So kind of the same thing has been adopted by the University of Chapingo. Uh, we have been going, working with uh, Roberto Rendon of CSTAM uh, by understanding how can we do this. Uh, I see this as a reading, as value chain could be kind of a 2D projection of what is going on, and uh, value networks can be kind of a 3D projection or kind of uh, isolating a specific player and understand which are the different uh, roles that this player plays, uh, being a client, being a supplier, being a complementer, or being a competitor. So we have been mapping the maize and wheat value chains with this perspective also. Uh, this is uh, an example of commercial network mapping exercises that we did with uh, Roberto Rendon um, in Oaxaca, in Chiapas, in four states. In 2016, we plan to keep working on uh, the next years uh, 
in this effort, what we do is to understand how do players relate to each other uh, in a specific uh, geographical context. We kind of take a picture of what is going on from a commercial point of view. We take the picture again after an intervention and understand whether new links have been produced so that uh, there, are, there are some factors that we cannot understand by reading a simple value chain, but by having this kind of uh, associations and relationships mapped, we get a better understanding. And we actually want our collaborators providing support to farmers uh, to also adopt this commercial networking mapping uh, methodology. So why did we start doing this kind of work? Uh, it was mostly because of the demand of the farmers. So Masagro, as you know, started operating in 2011. Soon after that, kind of a couple of years afterwards, we realized that we needed to develop or to put together a component that would help farmers to push correctly their product. So we were kind of helping them to increase their productivity, to increase their production, but some of them were not linked to markets or were linked occasionally to markets or not understanding market dynamics appropriately. And we understood that by, uh, by helping them to understand that, we could help them a lot. So we, um, we systematized with the lessons learned, like globally, uh, there was some, some work of, of CIMIT already in different projects and regions in farmer market linkages or in agricultural marketing or value chain uh, reading, and we incorporated that into the operation of Masagro. And of course, we, uh, we went through extensive literature review to see what, was, what had been uh, developed and how could we contribute to that. So this is an example of an infography of an early product that we developed saying what, what is the kind of um, route that a farmer should take by feeling that uh, is not competing with uh, his peer farmers or their peer farmers. They can organize themselves. They can do joint efforts together. Um, these are some examples of materials that we have been reading. So as, as Bran was mentioning, I was working at the marketing team at FAO, and uh, we recovered part of that work. Andrew Sheffer, Ed Seidler, David Caham, who were kind of, um, who have been writing uh, of this topic for years. Uh, these are some examples of projects of Foming, of the Inter-American Development Bank, and of course, and of course the, the socioeconomics program of CIMIT has developed also some quite interesting documents that we have been utilizing. Uh, these are some other examples. This is one of the last, actually, one of the last products uh, with Andre Duvaux and Jason Donovan working on an identification of experiences uh, in the CGR, but also outside of the CGR, and understanding how uh, the so-called VCD, value chain for development, could be better uh, increased. So starting from all this literature, we, uh, we intend to bring it back to what is going on, right? Uh, so we developed several guidelines, practical guidelines for farmers, for operators, to incorporate value chain development concepts in the, in the projects. So for us to, uh, for us to start uh, or to work on a, on a specific region, we need different elements to combine. So in, we need innovative farmers, we need an enabling environment, and we need willing buyers. So the farmers are innovative when they adopt sustainable intensification, sustainable agriculture, when they kind of do this transition from traditional methods to uh, innovation, which is uh, what we are uh, helping them to do with projects such as Masagro. Then uh, we provide capacity development in agricultural marketing strategies. And we, uh, uh, we understand that uh, promoting farmer organization is also key for these innovative farmers to succeed. Then we need an enabling environment. So for that to happen, we need uh, public pol policies that support the whole process. And uh, we work with public policies, pol policies at a multi-level. So not only at federal or national level, but also at a regional level. Another important factor is kind of identifying and highlighting the existing synergies amongst the different projects that might be uh, concurring in the same in the same region, and that is something that has been um, challenging, but we have been working through the different projects that are, for instance, taking place in Mexico. And then the, the fact of institutional networks strengthening and linkages. Uh, that means that we link with, uh, 
uh, already in place efforts in terms of uh, trading, marketing, farming organizations, uh, and we provide uh, support to, to those existing uh, structures. Then we need willing buyers, so we stimulate new business models. We will see what we understand for new business models in a minute. And um, also, uh, we uh, look for buyers that are interested in the triple dimension of sustainability, meaning environmentally, social, and economic sustainability, of course. So what do we understand by new business models? Uh, are those who include the stimulation of new services or goods associated with sustainable intensification interventions. For instance, the development of uh, appropriate mechanization services uh, or um, the development of uh, manufacturers of uh, post-harvest uh, tools, um, as well as generating extra added value to existing processes and players. This is a, a drawing that you have seen a thousand times, maybe. <laughs> So it's, it's the model of the, is the infrastructure of the innovation hub. So this is a model uh, along with we have been working for, for some years now. So the, the research platform is where, uh, is where, farm, is where uh, researchers uh, do hypotheses and we bring the uh, market related hypotheses also to this exercise. So by uh, using and validating varieties demanded by the industry into the research plots, and uh, also promoting market-oriented crop rotation, which also meets or combines uh, or adds to uh, agronomic uh, crop rotation. Then we go to the modules or to farmers that adopt those technologies, and, and we focus on uh, income efficiency and contract farming as a couple of um, areas of work with these farmers. Uh, those farmers uh, kind of um, serve as a model for others to adopt the technologies. And then we have the impact areas where we promote farmer organizations and a better value chain integration. So what are the expected results in farmer market linkages interventions? These are some of them, maybe. A strengthen overall competitiveness uh, in maize and wheat production systems from farm to the final product. So understanding where CMIT can add uh, meaningful value to producers, but also to other players in the value chain. Farmers' abilities recognized, developed, and enhanced. And also training is part of the core uh, business of CMIT to say. Uh, so we kind of tune up to, to, to specific training on markets. Business models based on the triple dimension of sustainability promoted, tools and methodologies to strengthen inclusive market approach, develop and spread, and dialogue foster among all value network actors. It's important to mention that uh, several players from the private sector, but also from the public sector, have seen uh, value in CMIT being a neutral facilitator of processes. And this is something that we have been doing with the interinstitutional working groups and some other um, spaces for common discussion. So when, when we uh, decide and when we are invited to provide input to a specific uh, project or a, to a specific need, uh, we start with a, with a diagnosis. So we understand what's going on, why we are required, why, wh what is the problem that we try to tackle, right? So we do, of course, literature review specific for that region to understand what, what has been, what have been uh, experiences that we can learn from. And then we do uh, a collection of primary information through sourcing methods such as value chain mapping and market research and do uh, further understanding of market needs by uh, understanding who would be the buyer or who would be the, the pool force in that uh, intervention that we want to promote. Then we design uh, a customized intervention based on the existing model and what the project might require. And we do start with the implementation of the project and a constant evaluation or, or feedback loop. Uh, so this is an iterative process uh, where we incorporate uh, information and communication technologies or meal indicators, monitoring, evaluation, accountability, and learning indications, uh, and learning, uh, and sustainability indicators that we bring into the formula. Then we scale out, and actually it's not the idea that CMIT does the whole process. 
especially not the last step of scaling out, uh, the idea is that we prove a methodology or that we prove an intervention to be worthy, uh, then the industry and the different players in the industry would have to play their role in validating that further and making, them, making it grow. Um, an important uh, area, as I was mentioning at the beginning, is, is providing appropriate training. So we developed several uh, courses uh, on, on market-related courses or training. Not all of them have been implemented yet. Some of them uh, are on their second year. Some others are still to be developed. As you can see, this is a wide program. So the areas would be contract farming, management of rural business, farmer organizations, and inclusive business models. And we have several trainings and with different addresses, each of them, each of those that we are pushing uh, in our agenda. And uh, there is also the importance to provide uh, sufficient and, and, uh, and useful um, um, materials for training uh, or for the dissemination of, of information or the view that we have. Uh, so one of the things that we think uh, it's missing in, in, in a lot of cases in Mexico is, is contract agriculture. Uh, and we have developed an explainer video explaining why it's a good idea maybe to organize and to, uh, and to understand what are the, are the benefits of contract agriculture being whoever it is uh, who provides that uh, contracting. Um, lastly, for this uh, session, uh, for this start of the presentation, uh, I wanted to explain that we are developing uh, farmer market linkages uh, specific indicators uh, to strengthen the indicator matrix uh, of the projects that we are working on. So in the area of productivity, uh, we are studying as results indicators yield, profit, available grain to trade, and adoption of contract farming as some significant indicators. And uh, we are discussing also with donors what are uh, impact indicators that are useful for them, uh, such as yield evolution, profit evolution, or market effective participation index, which is actually a, a recent indicator that we are uh, developing uh, these days. So now, how do we uh, how do we go from all of this theory or from this? Uh, ideas to practice or to implementation. Uh, these are the ongoing projects uh, in which uh, there is a component of farmer market linkages. Um, all of them are in Mexico at the moment. <laughs> uh, all of them are in Mexico. Of course, uh, part of our lab for uh, proving um, practices uh, was the Masagro, the federal project. Then we got Masagro Guanajuato where we could do some more uh, in-depth specific research, for instance, in the case of alternative crops for Guanajuato. Uh, and then we got uh, several projects with uh, main industry players, such as Kellogg's, Nestlé, or Grupo Bimbo, which have started quite recently within the last 12 months. And we have also a project in its second year now uh, in the peninsula de Yucatán with Fundación Haciendas del Mundo Maya. We will see a few examples of work going on on these projects. So what kind of activities, how do we phrase our interventions uh, in those projects? Here, there are some of them. Um, the idea is to provide value in, uh, in uh, doing value mapping exercises that are relevant at the hub level, at the region level. Uh, and we also uh, feel that are in a good position uh, to link uh, the work that is very being carried out in terms of agronomy, in terms of technology development, and in terms of, of markets. So these are some of the areas. I don't want to, to read them in detail, but you can see them here. Um, these are uh, instead some uh, typical typologies where we have been working for the last couple of years. Um, so animal feed sector, nixtamalization industry, agro industries, or the retail led uh, interventions or niche markets. In each of these areas, there are different goals depending on who is the uh, detractor or who is promoting the intervention. And we are uh, working with different products. So for instance, animal feed sector, white maize is not required, but triticale or barley are uh, incorporated as uh, interesting associated crops. In the nixtamalization industry, of course, is focused on, on white maize. Niche markets deals with land-raised maize. 
Uh, so we have a kind of a variety of, uh, of, um, of areas to intervene. And uh, as part of our exercise to review what was going on and, on, in terms of methodology, we, um, we, start, we identified that link methodology, who was, which was jointly developed by the CIAT in Colombia and IFPRI, uh, was a methodology that could be useful for grains and that had not been used for the grains. So we brought some people from, from CIA to help us incorporate that. And this methodology, what does is kind of assessing uh, inclusive and sustainable business models. And, and it's a methodology that starts, or that has four main tools. One is the value chain map, which means, okay, I understand where, where I am working, who are the actors, what roles are they playing. Then I design, or I understand what is the business model uh, with the business model canvas tool, which is a classic tool. Uh, in which we understand how the uh, different actors, being the, being the producer, being the aggregator, or being the, the end user, how do they see themselves, what kind of business do they uh, think they have or they play uh, in the chain. And then we do the new business model uh, principle, which is a tool to uh, evaluate how inclusive a trading relationship is and what can be modified in there. Uh, and then we go to the fourth tool, which is the prototype cycle, or actually implementing those modifications uh, into the business model of the, of the organization that we think can help out. And that is also guided by the same participants. Then it's a feedback loop. We keep working on this prototype of cycle until we understand that um, business relationship uh, between two players is, is, is actually optimized. Uh, what is interesting is to, is, to, is to highlight that we have been um, quickly uh, transitioning from the reading of the, uh, let's say, uh, theory materials to the implementation of those in field. So uh, in, four, in four of the seven projects that I mentioned before, in 2007, we, in 2016 and 2017, we have been uh, training, uh, let's say, uh, project partners to implement link uh, in, their, in the regions. And so we have some, some examples here. Uh, in Masagro, uh, we, got, we got like uh, six cases of uh, partners that are being using link, have been using link. In Masagro, Guanajuato as well, in the Kellogg's project as well, and in the Milpa Yucatan project as well. Uh, so uh, as you can see, some of this work is done with uh, native uh, or land race maize. Some other is done with uh, more typical or hybrid products, certified products, etc. So we have different, uh, different scenarios and different market typologies that we have been mapping. And this, uh, the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4 uh, refer to those numbers and are uh, the stage to which we have reached to date in those collaborations. Here we have some pictures from the field from our uh, partners, from, from these organizations in Mexico that are conducting this value chain mapping and, and following exercises. This is exercise one, value chain mapping. This is exercise two, where you do the model, the business model canvas. And it's interesting to see that they have been uh, quite happy and, and finding useful this, this methodology. This is actually inputs uh, that have been sent to us uh, during the last months from, from this uh, associated uh, organizations. Uh, so here we can see the value chain map of the north of Tlaxcala. Um, and uh, we can see here kind of the, the how accurate data we can have with these exercises. So this is, these are specific commercial data gathering from, from Tlaxcala where we have the different buyers that have been identified. What is the buying price that they pay uh, for the product? Uh, what is the kind of uh, payment method that they utilize? Uh, what is the demand, the estimated total demand that the buyer can have, and some quality requirements. So as you can understand, uh, this is very useful information for, for, for farmers to know and for uh, farm advisors to, help, to contribute to. Um, in Zacatecas State, uh, we did uh, a case of comparing bean and sunflower. Uh, where we actually valida validated that uh, by using sunflower in the innovation plot and being in the control plot, which is the typical uh, product in, in, in that region, we could see that 
maybe the benefit cost ratio of uh, using sunflower could be actually better. Uh, so we, are, we were accompanying some producers to move from bean to sunflower and to understand also what was the estimate demand uh, for, for sunflower. Um, as, a, as, a, as, a sum, as an example of, of the, these are some pictures of workshops that we conducted in, in 2016 and we uh, reached about 2,640 producers and other players in this um, uh, adoption or access to farmer market linkages component. Some other cases that I wanted to, to, to share with you is the project in Yucatan. Um, is, uh, in this project, we have a component to promote land race ma maize in niche markets. So uh, some of the activities that we have been doing leading to that objective is participatory workshop with farmers to review the project's commercialization strategy. So as Link suggests, we don't arrive to a community and say, this is what you need to do. Uh, rather, we go there, we work with farmers, we understand uh, through participatory workshops uh, what they want to do, if they uh, want to actually trade with their products, if they feel comfortable, comfortable with the way they are managing uh, their selling and, and so on. Then uh, we work on a catalog to promote land race maize, uh, which has been kind of a, it's been a, a, a complex exercise because we need to carefully assess what is the available uh, volume that can be traded, uh, especially in communities that have not been trading before. So uh, this is part of the, uh, of the exercises that we are doing. Uh, we review and provide uh, to the donor and to other interested parties uh, key considerations in terms of pricing and logistics. Uh, and the last uh, activity that we are doing is actually a tasting workshop where Natalia Palacios is helping to, um, to plan, which is uh, scheduled for, for next January, where we will have chefs and consumers characterizing uh, organoleptic characteristics of these uh, of three selected uh, maize varieties that have maybe a volume higher than others in the, in the peninsula of Yucatan uh, and that can be traded and, and appreciated by chefs and, and the consumers. This, this uh, slide shows part of the um, variables that we have been reading in the field, that we have been observing in the field, and that we uh, include into our recommendations to the, to the players. So, uh, for instance, in the case of land race maize produced in, in Peninsula de Yucatan, it, it, it of course belongs to the Milpa, Milpa system. So, Milpa system is highly conditioned by weather and by seasonality of, uh, of, of Milpa itself. Then, uh, in terms of prices, we have observed in local markets um, that price varies from 5 to 12 uh, pesos the kilo. Um, there are also opportunities to add extra value to products, for instance, premium quality or uh, certification. Uh, to date, uh, there is no uh, extra uh, value to, 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 the, to the product itself, so we think there is an opportunity there to increase uh, somehow um, the price that, that the farmers would receive. And, and also it's very important that we are always highlighting this part. In order to avoid local market distortions, we need further understanding or detailed understanding of local market dynamics uh, to establish maximum buying prices. So high prices might defer uh, existing uh, equilibrium uh, in terms of cell consumption or internal trade within the community. Um, those are some of the variables uh, or, uh, and, uh, and their affection uh, that we have been seeing uh, how the price uh, shapes in a specific local market. So this, take a, this takes us to, uh, to the whole other uh, range of products or projects that we are developing. So lately we have been writing and implementing uh, projects on responsible sourcing as you, can, uh, as you have seen. Uh, this is kind of, a, kind of a purpose that can be applied to most of them, uh, kind of the, the, the objective that we want to, 
to pursue. So to build and to, con and to consolidate a commercially sound responsible sourcing model aligned with the vision, procedures and requirement of the agro-industry, promoting the development of business relationships based on trust, stability and reciprocal profit generation and allowing companies to meet their local needs and with demand. As we have been seeing and as we have been uh, discussing for the last years, uh, if, um, CIMIT has now this this vision, this wider vision on interventions in the value chain. And we have seen that um, several companies uh, have an interest in shifting from uh, imports to uh, establishing long-term relationships with uh, local uh, producers of, of maize or wheat. So that's kind of the work that we are doing with, as I was saying before, Kellogg's, Nestle, or Bimbo. So we kind of combine the pull and the push mechanism to create uh, an, an enabling uh, environment for responsible sourcing projects to thrive. Those are uh, at, the, at the left. We have some, some activities uh, that, we, that we do uh, in terms of pull or push. Uh, as you can see, value chain mapping and analysis, support to private sector uh, in building a reliable local procurement, capacity development, uh, the, the support on sustainable intensification with technologies and agronomy that we do in every project market-oriented production and of course another value that we are shaping is uh, traceability and sustainability indicators all the way from farm to uh, to the company so um, here we have some drawings on what kind of interventions do we do we re do we do and how do we explain it so for instance this is the case of nestle and nestle wants to uh, increase the radio of, uh, of local procurement of maize in the state of Guanajuato, which is, which is actually quite low now and depends on a, on a, on a couple of intermediaries. Uh, and this is kind of the way we saw it. So we see, okay, there is uh, this company that has a high volume demand. Uh, there are farmers everywhere in the state. Most of them are disconnected. Some receive technical assistance, but it's just occasionally. And there are not uh, enough, there is not maybe uh, enough infrastructure in the region uh, in terms of uh, storage or logistics. So there are some problems that we have identified. So how can we solve these problems? Well, in terms of uh, reaching, we can help uh, identifying farmers uh, and help them to, uh, or convince them to create organizations. So this SPR is Sociedad de Producción Rural, so it's farmer organizations getting together. So technical assistance is provided by the project or by aligned projects. In this case, the government of Guanajuato is paying Masagro Guanajuato, is funding Masagro Guanajuato, and that helps, of course, to other players that want to, uh, to buy maize in the region. Maize or wheat, actually. In the case of, of Nestlé, is maize and wheat. Um, then we have a, a component, component of work with the communities, and that was for uh, the specific request of the donors. So we are promoting biofortified maize or QPM uh, in some uh, self-consumption uh, areas or smaller farmers in the, in the state of Guanajuato. Uh, we developed uh, sustainability indicators together with the company, and we, uh, and we are making sure with our monitoring evaluation and system that those indicators are being captured. Uh, then we also work with a number of partners, uh, but also financial partners, to make sure that there is uh, the inf that to make sure that the infrastructure needed for this project to, to work uh, is built, is, is, is in place. And, uh, well, this is kind of the drawing of the intervention. And we also understand that there are several uh, kind of producers uh, in, this, in this scenario, and that in parallel, uh, we are going to work with these three kind of group of producers uh, and we are actually helping them to transition from one category to other category. So uh, here, for instance, category C would be the, uh, the producers who are not linked to markets uh, and that are living like far from the, I don't know, from the company uh, reach out. So we work with them to make them uh, visible the importance of working together, of forming organizations, increasing the quality, uh, the homogeneity of their product. So hopefully these uh, producers will transition into group B, uh, which are uh, farmers who are already organized, but they are not added, adding extra value 
they are selling their products to maybe acopiadores, to those who storage, and then sell to the company. So maybe uh, if these organizations could do their, 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 their own storage, could add some value or could help, uh, could get a, then a, a better price for, for the service they provide. And we have the agregadores comerciales who are those who typically have been working with, with the company. So Nestlé or other companies, of course, rely in big uh, aggregators, but uh, the percentage of grain that they obtain from these aggregators is going to reduce as a percentage as other farmers uh, become suppliers as well of the company. This is uh, an example of work instead with, uh, with Kellogg's, uh, where we have been um, identifying uh, what, was, what were the main bottlenecks uh, between uh, the company are the main, and the main aggregator that they, that they deal with. So whoever is familiar with link methodology and will, will understand that this is uh, one of the, the tools that uh, we utilize, which is a scorecard analysis where we see the perception of uh, how good, how healthy is the relationship and the mutual understanding between the company and the main aggregator. And when we see that there is a difference uh, in, in reading or understanding of their position, then we kind of try to solve this, uh, this difference. Then we do a value chain, uh, we have done a value chain risk matrix, understanding what were the main factors that could affect that could affect the sustainability of the, of the company business. And we provided this kind of exercises, which is not Chinese, but almost, but the company has the code. So I, couldn't, I, I didn't want to put here uh, exactly what were the recommendations, because this is, of course, confidential information. But we identified different kind of risks. Uh, we identified possible mitigation strategies and uh, suggested route of action. This is also an example of a value chain map that we conducted for, for, for this la, last project. And well, this, take, this takes me to the last slide, uh, which is what is coming. Uh, we have been quite, I would say, quite dynamic during the last uh, few months in incorporating new topics. Um, we would like to see uh, what, is the, what, what are the opportunities to include public procurement uh, responsible public procurement into uh, the grain sector. So there are some projects uh, in Brazil uh, and also in the European Union of governments buying grain uh, for, um, I don't know, it can be for, for the jail, for the prison system, for the schools. And uh, so this public expenditure uh, in food is, is being reoriented to more, uh, to incorporate some sustainable indicators or, or, or awareness, kind of awareness. Uh, another area of work is uh, using uh, the information communication tools for, tra for better traceability and transparency. Uh, it is interesting to notice that IBM or Walmart have been, going, have been working with blockchain technology to incorporate those uh, elements of, of, of high-end technology into the food sector. And we think that CIMIT could also play a role there. We are working on understanding what could be actually our fit. Um, there are organizations as, such as the Sustainable Agriculture Initiative or ICL Alliance, which uh, actually support companies in uh, developing sustainability standards. And uh, we are in contact with, this, with these organizations to understand what is coming next in terms of sustainability indicators so that we can be uh, ready to provide that kind of uh, information to the companies or to whoever we are working with in projects. And another element that we would like to incorporate uh, then within next year maybe is participatory guarantee systems uh, or participatory certification, also known as participatory, participatory certification, as a close to zero cost uh, option for farmers to certify uh, their products, which we think is something that um, there are several cases of, uh, of success, uh, particularly in Asia. Now Mexico is kind of starting to explore this self-certification scheme. We think it's something where we can contribute to. And that was about it. Uh, I hope you. <laughs> cool. If you have questions now, we have some minutes and I'm happy to respond.
Yeah, thank you, Victor, for the presentation. I think you showed a lot of tools, which is always nice, I think, showing really how to do it. Of course, my question is about scaling, because the word even popped up. <laughs> Maybe you can go to, I think it's the fifth slide or so, where you, you had this uh, flow chart, and then at the end it was like, and now we need to scale out. Uh, yeah, that one. So um, my question is, uh, now you say we focus very much on the design and implementation, and then the next step would be scale out, right? So I, th I assume that in the first two blocks you reach maybe hundreds of, of, or thousands of beneficiary, basically, and the next you want to go to millions, right? Mm -hmm. So I, th I think you would agree that this is maybe more complex than, than what we're actually doing now. So um, question is, what, how do you see the role in, um, in, in supporting that scaling out process? And, and B, who should take the leadership on that block then if we are not going to do it? Well, I think scaling out has to go through different steps or through different phases. And to the last station, we are probably not going to be the lead of that uh, reaching millions. But we can, uh, do, some, um, we can do some interventions uh, in a way to make sure that uh, a process is validated and it works out. So for instance, uh, it wouldn't be enough if we uh, assume it, uh, start implementing the link methodology and think, look, this is something which is working out, but we don't help others to do that. And we don't count on others' opinion to do that. So as a first step into this scaling out exercise is to work with uh, different um, uh, partners uh, who are private small companies providing services to, to farmers in Mexico uh, that have been trained and are using themselves this methodology and seeing if there is any value in that. So if they when they understand that that's useful, they will do their own business by, uh, by providing that service. And that's a first step to, to, uh, to scale out. Um, then uh, the same thing, similarly, it works with the companies. So the companies, uh, when they see that a pilot is working out successfully for them. Uh, for instance, in the case of Bimbo, it's very clear that what they want to do is a pilot because they want to focus on, I don't know, it's not even 10% of their total procurement. But the idea is to, scale the, is to scale it out to other regions, to other countries, to other crops. Or maybe in the case of, Mex of Bimbo, not to other crops, but maybe in the case of Kellogg's, that they have more uh, different ingredients, they would do that in other ingredients. So we just kind of put the seed in there uh, and see if we can support to, to the scale out process, but <laughs> it's a complex it's a complex topic. But I think we are we are working on that. Uh, could you tell us more about the indicators of sustainable farming? and whether those get all get into climate change amelioration or any of those aspects? Um, there are indicators. Uh, in most of our projects, we have indicators of um, knowledge, of uh, environmental, uh, of the, of an environmental uh, area, and of production or productivity. So in terms of farmer market linkages, we are more focusing on those having to deal with productivity. Um, as I refer briefly, there are several organizations working on sustainability indicators for the agricultural sector. So we discuss with the specific donor in each case, what kind of indicators are you interested in? Some of them, uh, most of the indicators that the company are interested in belong to the environmental part or to the income part. So I want my farmers uh, to be more successful in terms of uh, return of investment. Or I want my farmers to have a better management of the water. So some of them are, uh, are managed by our colleagues of, of the agronomics, uh, and some others are work out, work out by, by ourselves. So these are the ones that we are kind of monitoring more closely, controlling, so we understand that it's not only about producing more, but, a, but about being more competitive in the way you produce. And by indicating and by monitoring uh, that over the years, we understand that as a farmer uh, have, has been successful in incorporating uh, more, um, uh, more profit into, the, into its business. Um, then there is this, the, the, this last indicator I was referring before, market effective participation index, refers to, to what extent a farmer is aware of the existence of uh, different markets and how uh, he or she 
plan strategically his production towards meeting market demands. So that's an indicator that after a number of years, we understand how that farmer has transitioned and that is valuable for us to understand whether it had made sense our intervention or not. Still is an area uh, under, under constant development and review, but uh, I hope this addresses a bit your question. All right, so um, our job is international agricultural research, so we should also be interested in ensuring comparability across countries, regions, and so on. So these indicators, it, you know, it, it, it would help if, if um, we can ensure some kind of comparability with, say, what we're doing in South Asia. Um, so number one would be water use efficiency, two, um, nutrient use efficiency from a, and three uh, emissions. Mm -hmm. And are they covered or not? Mm. Well, uh, what we're doing, I don't know, Bram, do you want to? Yeah, just, I mean, I think it's a bit mis mis misleading putting this one. This is a selection of indicators as, a, as an example. There is the table of indicators, which includes yes. profitability and greenhouse gases, and it's, it's a whole full table that has been developed. This is an extract, which is also fed into the discussions with monitoring and, ev with the monitoring and evaluation and learning unit, uh, or, I mean, or what, what, whatever it is, that is also working across with the CGIR. The so working group. it's not that this is just a selection, so it may be a bit misleading by putting these out. I think, the, I mean, this is an example of a specific, specific project where it is important to highlight is indeed not all projects are measuring all the indicators. So maybe yeah. the next step of discussion is what are the minimal indicators that we agree across regions that you should measure. Um, being part of those discussions, it becomes very interesting because usually we step out of the meeting saying every tongue should be the minimum indicators you should measure because depending the social economist is this, this is this, etc. On the other hand, there is obviously also the dimension of the donors. So, I mean, USAID is looking at indicators, Agarpa is looking at indicators, we have the Coneval who is doing everything for Mexico. So, I'm not sure, I mean, I don't have the answer where that ends up in the end, but somewhere we need to evolve it. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, yeah. And just to add on, on, on Bram, on, on the indicator, there's a lot of methodological challenges also to have indicators that are robust across geographies. One aspect of indicators, especially for that type of work, are social indicators, you know, equity, whether you build equity in systems with uh, responsible sourcing, for example. It's a, it's a very interesting question. So in CIMIT, but not only in CIMIT, we are quite a, quite a few being interested in getting methods and metrics for those indicators, and I think it requires a bit more investment. So that's part of it. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I have been discussing with, with Bram this for for, for, for some time already. And uh, the idea is that we fine tune first what are uh, valid methodologies and useful indicators for both the beneficiaries that we are working with and for what the industry may demand. And then how do we streamline those indicators within the project portfolio of the program and, and beyond of all the different regions. Yeah, I think it's interesting to look, I mean, Andrea, who's, who's on maternity leave, has been working on that and, and maybe it's interesting to ask her to give a presentation. But also for me, just to add, it has been quite interesting that on methodologies, et cetera, is completely different if you look at it from the, from the business perspective, because they want those data streams to go in business continuity, which needs to be uh, auditable by PWCs and those companies that then need to be trans able to translate that into financial indicators for them, because then their insurance goes down. I mean, that's a whole, even a whole different dimension where that, we may not be thinking of, but if we don't do that, we cannot connect it and then the pool yeah. goes away of what is driving this because in the end, the company is creating a pool for that. So it's, I mean, it's even more, it's making it just a little bit more, more complicated. And, and another factor that is important is the, time, is, is the time that it requires to capture the indicators, analyze, and kind of present them. So the industry is pressing us to have 
quicker response ratio than we had previously with institutional donors, which would be okay with us releasing data of two years old and saying, okay, this is the indicator of production of the state of Oaxaca 2014. And you are delivering that in 16. And so now the companies are telling us, okay, I want some system where I can see, uh, if not in real time, at least with a delay of maximum a month, uh, who are our beneficiaries, how are they performing in the field. And so it's something that we are actually trying to, to tackle with, with, uh, with the BEM, Bitacora Electronica, and some other tools that uh, Andrea and others are working on. I'm not adding anything yeah. because I think we could have a two-hour seminar only on indicators. Yeah, we will, we will probably. And, and, and again, I mean, you mentioned the cost-benefit of, of, of indicators, you know. I mean, you can have indicators that interest many people, but they are very difficult and very costly to, uh, uh, to obtain. Mm -hmm. the, upscaling of indicators as well, you know, can measure things at the feed level for full few farmers, but how do you scale that, you know, when you start working in a much mm -hmm. wider uh, an environment? And I think all those issues are of interest, I think, for CIBIT, because more and more also donors are asking for those indicators as a, uh, a metric of, of success. Well, us. greenhouse gas emissions is, is, is the typical case where I think we should uh, kind of work closely with CCAFs and others to understand what is going to be our methodology? A question, because I think that was an interesting comment, and that we have, I mean, that we have been discussing, and I, just to, for you to, to talk a bit about that, how do we, I mean, how do we avoid, or how do we at least put the the, the signals there that by the interventions, instead that we are making sure that we enter at a leveled playing field, because. Uh, one of the elements is you could say, I take the farmers and I put them in contact with the company, but that is not a level playing field because the co company is probably much, way more experienced with negotiating to farmers, which for them are, are, are suppliers, and that's what they do. They negotiate their supply mm -hmm. chain. So uh, can you comment some of the tools and elements that are being thought of to avoid falling in that trap and actually creating a disparity uh, rather than opportunities in a pool? for the sustainable interventions? So one uh, thing that we need to clarify every time is that we are not traders. So that, in that we cannot make sure that uh, by linking farmers to companies, uh, we are, uh, business is going to happen by itself. So uh, what, we, what we see is that we uh, want to, on one hand, empower farmers to understand uh, what is the value of the product they have uh, what are the different markets they can go to, uh, and what are the benefits of working together or by developing a formal uh, contract farming or by uh, developing kind of loyalty uh, to, the, to the potential companies that are interested in their products. So that's, that's a whole uh, set of work. And from the other side, we work with the companies um, to kind of transmit the, the need to uh, understand the, uh, the characteristics of the farmers of the specific region where they want to source from. Um, they, of course, know the people, but they, don't, they might not know how they would react uh, to changes in the, in, in the environment, such as um, changing um, price uh, scenario or changing weather scenario. Uh, so this kind of, uh, of, um, of uh, awareness is important for the companies to have. Uh, and also, we help the companies to understand what are the benefits of uh, promoting uh, local procurement instead of uh, imports uh, in terms of marketing of image for, for the companies. And that they are seeing value in that, so they are kind of open now to, to consider buying local. Victor, I have an issue of that uh, we know that uh, Mexico is divided into monocropping zones. No? We have Trigueria, Cebaderia, and so on. Uh, so uh, we want to, as a part of sustainable uh, intensification, we want diversification as one of the components. On the other side, the contract farming is more towards specific quality, trade, commodity. And monocropping suits contract farming and the vice versa. How you see diversification and market linkage? 
in your, these kind of interventions? Uh, contract farming should be used only if useful. So that means that not all the companies and not all farmer groups are seeing value in contract farming because uh, contract farming is limited by uh, stipulated programs. So in that case, Mexico and Zagarpa has a CERCA and a CERCA has a service of contract agriculture, which proved to be useful and, and popular in some regions and not in others. So uh, to start with this, uh, with this thing, for us, contract farming is not uh, an obligation. Then, uh, in terms of what uh, products do we suggest in crop rotation, uh, we, also, we always start from uh, understanding agronomics. So, whenever we see that there are several options in terms of agronomy uh, appropriate rotation, we see uh, out of those who is the one, what is the one that makes more sense from a market perspective, but not the other way around. We don't see, we don't say, okay, in Bajio there is a new factory of uh, oil, of, of papas fritas, and then we need to, to get oil from this kind of leguminosas. So, we just uh, understand in the system which is needed, which is kind of uh, helping to nurture soils and then out of that we we provide some recommendation hi I have a question especially you are talking a lot about market specifically about big markets in Nestle bimbo what about small-scale farmers if we see them yes of course also as, as producers and as consumers of their own um, cereals as maize and then if we try to connect them with, um, you say, um, chefs or these mm -hmm. other high-level -like restaurants, how do we ensure that, we, uh, that they can still have their own volume for self-consumption? And they, if we give them a nice price and all these uh, contracts, yeah. of course it's going to be a really nice incentive to sell everything or most of it. And then what are they going to eat if they prefer to eat their own maize? And mm -hmm. perhaps we are going to make a different type of impact in, yeah. their, like, in their diets. Yeah, well, I think that was, that was pointed out. By, I mean, we do that by carefully assessing case by case. Uh, first, uh, we cannot say that large farmers supply only large companies. So the idea is that large companies also supply from small and medium farmers that get organized. And that's what we are doing in Bajio. That we are, we are doing uh, in, in, Son in Sinaloa, not so much, but in Estado de Mexico, yes, we are doing that. Uh, for those niche market pool, for that niche market pool, um, that they want maybe some very specific products, uh, land raised maize, uh, we have been doing this exercise community by community in Peninsula de Yucatan to understand what is the percentage of product that they consume, what is the percentage of product that they uh, trade in their communities, so we don't affect that. We help them to increase their production, and with that surplus of production, we start talking about uh, selling that. So the volumes are incredibly low for the first year. Uh, then we want to help them to make uh, to to see. Okay, maybe they have three hectares of land in in average. They are uh, planting less than an hectare because it's what they need. But maybe next year they will think, okay, I'm gonna duplicate my production because I know I will have. Um, who, someone who is going to buy from, from me. So volume setting and uh, price setting is, is key and is, and is something that we work on in every specific community. This is very time demanding. So uh, what we would want to do is uh, that we have uh, the private sector, I mean, small companies, farm advisors, despachos, agricolas that provide a service to farmers. Questions, comments? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>